Hi everyone, welcome to Voice of the Elders Mending the Soul of the Village podcast. I'm Eartha Love and um, this is a podcast that I've created to uh, to help the, the next seven generations have access to the voices of the elders. Um, as uh, you know, most of you that know my work now work with rites of passage and how vital it is that the elders and the youth can speak to each other and help uh, with initiation and rites of passage. So today I have um, Caroline Carey and I'm really excited about this um, conversation because um, her work is incredible. She's um, got a body of work called Middle Earth Medicine and it's really a uh, work of my heart that around the soul and shamanism and rites of passage and uh, Caroline's been doing it for 30 years mentoring uh, soul work with dance and song and drumming and I just really really feel that this conversation just naturally is everything that I'm asking for with this podcast because her work is just that her work is actually what this podcast is about so I always have this set of questions Caroline about that I sent you that I asked the elders but it's almost like your work answers all the questions anyway <laughs> so yeah I'm just gonna let it flow because you're all you're already working on the level that I really want to have well for everyone to hear but you know I really want this podcast to reach the younger generation as they move through their rites of passage so I always start with um the elder so you to just open like in any way that you want this podcast as this act of service for those that are listening especially our younger people so thank you Caroline for coming and thank you for being here it's really amazing to sit with you Oh, thank you so much uh, for, for inviting me here and uh, much love to you and everyone who's listening. Uh, it's a real delight to share my own experiences. And uh, yeah, you asked me to open this um, podcast with something like a prayer. And, and the first words that came to me was uh, a little sentence that I've always said and I've always shared with others. Um, and I was talking to my husband about it yesterday because he said, if we were talking about death, and that's, you know, as we get older, that's a conversation that's wise to have. And I said, I wanted a bench on the hilltop where I walked. And on the, on, the words on it would be, life is a beautiful gift, receive and smile. And there's a lot in that uh, for me, because life is a gift, you know, and I, I believe it's a gift. Um, it doesn't always feel like it. Sometimes it does, but sometimes, you know, of all the challenges and the difficulties we can have growing up and in our later years as well, um, it doesn't always feel like a gift. But if we can receive it in some way like a gift and smile, that can change our attitude to so many different things. And, uh, you know, just that just smiling, if we smile, it changes our mood. It changes so much about us. So, um, and, and we also hold a particular gift ourselves for our communities and for society, um, for, for the animal kingdom, for, you know, for, for the planet, for the earth. Um, we hold a particular gift, each one of us. And so if we can recognize that and smile about it, I think it uh, brings much more joy into our heart. So I hope that's helpful. Wow, that's so beautiful. I think you've answered all of my questions just in that first bit. <laughs> you know, that's why I have this opening, because it's like so, you know, everything you've just said there is exactly why I'm doing this. And so, you know, the, the fact that you started with death, with this beautiful um, opening, is, you know, what I feel about you know what what we need especially as women as we get older well all you know all elders but um for me working with a lot of younger sisters is this place that we're at of like you know how what you know what is death what is rites of passage and how can we help 
youth initiate when we've lost our culture of an, of rites of passage, when we're so fragmented that we don't have those rites of passages for our youth. And even if, even for those of us who are working with rites of passage, not they don't necessarily want it because mm. they don't understand what it is. So what, you know, what, what I feel is what are we saying to our young people in any moment that we can as an act of mentoring around what is death and what is this gift, um, you know, that can be transformed through dying that I feel part of your work around the soul. So if you could speak first a little bit to that, what you just said about, you know, death and rites of passage. Yeah, I, I... Well, there's two things there, isn't there? There's the rites of passage and, and death. And of course, death is a rite of passage. Um, and, I, and I tend to think of our rites of passage, not necessarily as something we've lost, because in some ways we have lost them, but I think it's more about forgetting. We've forgotten mm -hmm. them. But when I work with people, um, what we try and do is, is to look at Yes, that the actual essence of it might have been forgotten, but it is still there. I think we're always going through our rites of passage, whatever, you know, that they, they, they happen to us. And we can't, we can't not experience them. So, you know, a, a, a girl's first bleeding, that's her rite of passage. It happens. But how does it happen? And does she receive support in that? Um, you know what what what's her mother's attitude towards it that affects her um, her friendships how is she in herself with it she has her rite of passage but she might not celebrate it and that's what other cultures often do or tribal communities they tend to celebrate these rites of passage or make more meaning of them rather than like my mother unfortunately did was when I shoved my underwear in my in the bottom of the laundry basket terrified of what she might think because I had no idea um and um and it was sort of brushed under the carpet or oh, let's keep quiet about that don't tell your brother don't tell your father and uh, this is what you use and stick it in your drawer that was it you know as far as my mother was concerned with that bless her that's how she had been brought up you know same kind of thing so you know no hard feelings towards her that's okay um, I've created my own rites of passage around that myself. Um, and then, you know, for young boys, you know, what they're coming into puberty, what happens to them? What do they experience? Very similar kind of things, you know, where their things start to work differently for them, their sexual organs develop, and suddenly they might be having wet dreams or whatever's happening to them. Um, their voices change. There's a rite of passage. It happens. It's going to happen. But are we going to make meaning from it? And are we going to celebrate it and avoid the shaming that comes with it? Um, the leaving home story, I find that's a particular one that I work with mm. people of any age, because I, I notice how the, the leaving home story repeats itself throughout our lives. When we leave a job, when we leave a, a house, when we um, leave a relationship, there are very similar patterns throughout. And so there's all little mini rites of passage playing themselves out constantly through our lives. And mm -hmm. we can learn to make meaning from them. And we can go back and look and see and say, okay, this happened. All oh, that's still playing itself out now in some way. And maybe I need to give it more attention. And maybe I need to bring some celebration around it or... Um, or yeah, just make make that story uh, more interesting for myself. Yeah, absolutely. I think I think this is where we have become a bit lost in a um, in 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 the map of our life's journey because we haven't got these particular pointers to say, okay, this is where the change is happening, um, mm -hmm. and and so yeah, then we do forget the importance of them. But it's just reminding ourselves that these moments in our life are are important, and because uh, the bigger one, menopause for women, which I think you know on some level happens with men as well, though obviously it's not on a physical plane, um, that you know we 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 change so much so deeply at that point. It's such a powerful time for women. Um, you know, I'm 13 years post menopause. Um, it's still having its effect on me, and now I'm finding the meaning 
from it for me and translating that back to old circles of, of women who are, are working with that particular passage at this time. Um, and I find it fascinating, uh, absolutely fascinating. So that's a little, and then, then when it comes to death, I think we're having mini deaths throughout our life. There's always a, a, a mini death of letting go of something, surrendering to something, saying goodbye to something. Um, and these are our little mini deaths that affect our ego. So if we can acknowledge them and allow them and surrender to them, I think we come to a, um, a much more graceful place in our lives. And it's it's like a rehearsal for the big death, mm. Mm. That big letting go. You know, can I really surrender to this? Um, you know, I'm I'm not afraid of death. I don't want to die, which is said by a lot of people. I don't want to die yet. I feel like I've got so much work to do, and there's so many projects and beauty and artwork and creativity and you know my whole body of work. You know, bringing that into the world. Um, it's a big birthing that I'm going through, really. Um, but um, I will die at some point, that's for sure. And I talk about my death quite openly and how I would like it to be. Very simple, nothing major. Um, I've talked to my children about it. And, um, you know, we're, we're very open about how, how it might be. I hope I'm reasonably conscious when I die. That's the main thing I would ask for. We'll see. I feel, yeah, what you're saying, you know, uh, mirrors my own work with rites of passage and everything you said is what I'm trying to hold for other women mainly. And, you know, this threshold that you talked about of leaving, you know, I call it first flight, that first moment where you left your village, you left your family and you you move out. And it's like, yeah, it is everything. And it's like what, you know, when you're talking, it's like, um the path that I've got is trying to bring consciousness to the unconscious. So like you said, this the sort of frag what I feel the fragmentation that's happened in our culture because we are unconscious in what our bodies are going through, what you know, as they change and grow, we're so uh, and develop, we're so unconscious because we don't make ceremony, we don't make meaning out of these places and it's like the surrender like you talked about that it takes to move into the next phase into the new version of yourself and you know what I you know what where I'm trying to get to with this podcast is that I feel that that is that is the spiritual practice of being human yeah. and and so when I'm talking to younger people about you know so first I want to ask you is like how do we help make ceremony then make me how do we help people make meaning when they're going through a rites of passage and they don't know how to be conscious with the changes that are taking place and allow it to take them through into the new version of themselves how do they surrender how do we help them surrender and then that leads into the question of like well how do they how do they navigate the you know ceremony in a good way how do they know what a true ceremony is and how you know how you know there's so much going on in the world isn't there and this spiritual practice of just going through our changes in a good way and our development in a good way and allowing that to be our spiritual practice is the groundedness that I feel helps us to to see the untruths of or of other um you know, the spiritual consumerism, I'm going to say, that's happening, the sort of the business of spirituality. So, yeah, just feeling those questions in what you're saying about how do we help bring the conscious to the rites of passage with yeah. ceremony? And then how and then what's the difference between that way and like how, how that helps us to navigate the spiritual business that's there that I feel leads people off their own inner soul yeah. yeah there's a lot of questions there yeah i've got so many questions <laughs> all the time that's my life <laughs> i get it um well you know you started by talking about how do we um encourage or get those you know especially youngsters to come and and you know explore these things and 
all I can think of is when when my teenage girls, for example, when it was their time for for their rite of passage, and I so wanted to create something that was um, more meaningful for them and something that I hadn't received myself. But you know, teenagers of today, they're not necessarily going to want to go down, no. especially from mum, who <laughs> they know best. Teenagers know best. And they we do. have to remind ourselves of that. Because if my mother had created something for me, would I have wanted it anyway from her? Who knows? I can't go back and find out. Um, <laughs> so, but I did what felt appropriate more for them. And which meant a, a little gift and a, a meal out and, um, you know, and, and try to make it something that they would appreciate at their time of life and that um yeah just to say that there had been something um and I don't think they would have wanted any more than that even if they wanted that you know it was I think they would have in some ways preferred me to just be quiet about it and they go and talk to their friends about it I don't think we can force anything on anybody unless they really want it mm -hmm. we can talk about it and we can lead by example and that's what I would always say what's my story What's my yeah. story around this? And by me sharing my story, I I then might inspire, I might encourage others to want something similar. And that that's all we can do, I believe. There's no pushing, there's no forcing, there's no um, even trying to encourage others. We just lead by example. And, and by doing that, I think we're much more authentic in ourselves and and much more honest about what you know what we need and what we want because i could want my daughters my sons my grandchildren to go through certain experiences but it's not up to me it's mm -hmm. really that is the big part of the spiritual path for so many of us we're trying to enforce our beliefs and systems on others which we see all the time and it's mm -hmm. not me to engage with that it's not for me to say what's right for another person all it is right what's right with me is that I share my story I share the work that I've developed through my life's journey yeah and if it resonates with another person great if it doesn't fine yeah when I can't be all things to all people and neither should I try so anything mm -hmm. that, for me that says you know I should be or that those people should be doing this um, is that's that's being as unprincipled and unspiritual as anything else. So I think that's what else did you ask me in that one? Yeah, time? I mean that exactly what you're saying. So yeah, that's what brings me into the spiritual consumerism that I see going on, and you know, uh, you know, I I sort of I'm in two minds. It's like the, we call it the new age, and it's like. I see the evolution necessary and, you know, it's all part of the gift of it, isn't it? I know that you work with like bringing through the gift, transforming wounds into wisdom. So that's part of the new age, isn't it? But I want to speak to, you know, this exactly what you said. How how do we just hold the space then for our younger generations to navigate the spiritual business that's happening or the new age movement that's happening so they can find what they what their soul's calling for or what they need or what a teacher a guide in a good way because there's so much isn't there to there yeah. is so much and it is quite frightening out there the market is saturated with spirit yeah. and the other and shamanic list that and the other like it's the new sexy kind of uh, you know, appliance or um application or drug or whatever it is you know it's out there um, and I think it's a minefield for young people and not just young people but you know middle-aged whatever age we are yeah we're looking for something we're searching for something and I think all of this kind of consumerism and all the the medicines that have been brought across from other lands all that kind of thing I think that's you know, in some ways, and I heard this said by a dear friend of mine recently, um, who, who said, you know, there has been a place for that. It's it's almost part of the awakening. It's going to wear itself out in a way. Yeah. 
and hopefully you know well we feel hopefully it will start to um diminish somewhat and it's it's the awakening that's happened in order for us to find out what's truly ours and i'm hearing this a lot from people who've tried out other methods and models and um, different cultures medicines and the like and then they've come back to saying well you know what is it about this culture this that doesn't kind of fit and i had my own experience with that where i i took some plant medicine in a very um in, you know in in that country where where it, it grew and and i i was i was very interested and fascinated by it um and i had a, a kind of experience you would expect nothing major major but it was an experience and i'm i'm happy to have had that but then I realized the community I was in were all engaging with it. And I noticed because I work shamanically with my own land, and I, I would be careful even using that word because shamanism isn't of our culture's um, heritage. It's the, just that name doesn't come from our, my English heritage. And so I, I tend to look more at soul work, um, spirit work. That's what I do. Um, and animism. But they were all following this particular path. And I noticed that in my animistic um, soul work nature, my the, the guidance that I received was confused by the guidance I was getting from other culture, this other culture. And I could sense this sort of disturbance in myself where I was going, but it doesn't fit with this land, the land I'm walking upon. You know, it, it doesn't fit here. It doesn't grow here. Um, it doesn't understand this area, the elements or forces here and the environment, even the animals. And I'm starting to get very kind of discombobulated through <laughs> by using this. And I, I didn't use it very many times. It was just on a, you know, just a three or four occasions. Um, and so it really, it was a great teaching for me to recognize what, what was going on and that I had to withdraw and the withdrawing of it was quite hard for me because my community was so involved in it. Mm -hmm. And so I was pulling away from my community as well as this new idea that something could be helpful for me. Um, and, and I never looked back. I never, ever looked back. I'm totally devoted to the spirituality that is connected to this land and the heritage of that, the old ways that um, could start to you know, reinforce themselves once we realize it. And so I think, yeah. I think those medicines have had their place and I, and I think they are coming to a head. I, think, I don't think they will continue particularly. I think there's too much ego behind it all that is going, you know, like, oh yeah, th this, this is, um, it's become money making it's become a big business it's become something that we don't really need at all and so we're it, it will start to really feel it and i think we have to yeah. trust that to a certain extent because we can't stop these things happening we've had cultural yeah. for for years and years and um you know it's it's honoring those cultures and their medicine by not thinking we can make a business out of them yeah disturbs them as well as us yeah yeah not right yeah 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 i totally agree so that's what where i was getting to you know this path of the soul and knowing who you truly are and that inner guidance that is there like you talked about surrender and to me that allows the grace to come in to help us to feel our soul and then I feel like our soul intrinsically woven with the soul of the world, the soul of nature. So like when you're talking, I'm feeling like, you know, how we're woven in. Our souls are woven in with this land. And so when we're when we're working with a, a plant from another uh, land, we haven't got that same relationship. We have a relationship with all of nature, don't we? But we don't have that same um soul relationship we'd have to cultivate it wouldn't we we'd have to tend to it to get to know it uh fully to deepen into that right relationship with it so 
you know when i'm talking to young people i'm 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 just bringing it back to the soul all of the time to help them to feel what's right for them whether that's the right ceremony whether that's the right thing and whether it's something they might need in the moment and so yeah i'd like you to to in like in your work like how do we how do we help how do you work with people to to bring out that the, their knowing of themselves as, as a soul how does that work in your work mm. well I I started I suppose <laughs> really when I was very very young I was a, a very young child um, and I was brought up in a very religious way so Christianity was a, a big thing for my family we went to church and I went to Sunday school so I was already being taught the art of prayer and I think that was really helpful to me, even though I wasn't keen on going to church and I didn't like the the priests and the, the sermons. And, you know, it was all a bit boring for me in those days. And I wanted to be out in nature and be with my animals and things. But I'm, I'm really grateful for the fact that I was taught prayer and to believe in something greater than myself. I think that was really helpful. And then I was sent to a convent and I got quite confused at that point because I was Church of England and the convent was Catholic. And so we were treated very differently to the Catholic girls. But my mother used to make us put our hand on the Bible and swear if um, on, on it, if we had done something wrong or if she thought we were lying or something like that. And she'd make us promise things. Um, so my hand was very regularly put on the Bible to tell the truth about something and she said if you're lying or if you're being naughty your your soul won't go to heaven yeah and I used to think what is the soul what is that um, and what is this heaven place and I was ever so ever so curious about the soul and I used to have a lot of little animals like pets like um, guinea pigs and rabbits and hamsters gerbils you know we had all sorts of, of little things um, I was absolute absolute animal lover but of course they die. And uh, when they die, I was consoled in the fact that I knew their souls would go to heaven because of course they were good. Um, so I was I was in the, this sort of communication with these animals. And when they died and buried them, you know, I, I would still be wanting to communicate with them, you know, believing in this soul thing, whatever it was. But then at the convent, um, I remember one of the sisters, she would take the the bad Church of England girls, the Protestant girls, into one classroom while all the good little Catholic girls went off into another. Um, and, and she would tell us all sorts of things like, um, you know, you're going to have to be really careful because you could get pregnant if you kiss a boy. And she, she was she was putting the, you know, <laughs> painting us as very, very bad little girls who were going to get into all sorts of trouble. Um, <laughs> And bless her, she was a great catalyst for me around the soul's journey because she used to say animals didn't go to heaven. Their soul didn't go to heaven. Animals didn't have souls. And I remember thinking, I'm going to prove her wrong. I'm going to find a way. So hence the communicating with the animals and the bones of animals and being absolutely sure that they must have souls. And so my my understanding with them just got stronger and stronger and my way of communicating with them so I really felt that I I knew their soul and I had a, a a lovely old horse that we had in Ireland and she died of old age Ruby her name was and she had her head on my lap and as she she, she was she was just very very old and it was her time and we knew that so she was lying there head on my lap and taking her last few breaths and as she took that last breath, she lifted her head and her eyes rolled and and then her head dropped on my lap and, and her life went. But I felt it. I felt this life force move from her right the way through my body. And I shook. I literally shook and almost fell backwards. If her head hadn't been on my lap, I think, and I didn't have something to hold on to, I would have flattened on the floor. Um, it was so immense and so strong. And I remember thinking... There's her soul. I've proved Sister Mary Edwards wrong. There's my heart. There's the soul of, of an animal. And wherever it's gone, it doesn't matter. But she did have a soul. And so I spent my years with my children wondering about their soul. And could I 
understand their soul in some way and what their journey would be. And that was for me to just leave to them, not for me to interfere with, but it was for me to encourage them with the things that they loved. Yeah, what did they love to do? What did their soul, what was their soul's calling? What do, were they good at? What were they mostly interested in? What were their passions in life? And I followed that and I followed it throughout their lives, trying to keep as hands off as I possibly can, because it's not my business what their yeah. purpose is. And when it comes to schooling and education, we did a lot of homeschooling and, um, you know, just observing, observing what's going on here. And to this day, I do. And with my grandchildren and what I've done with that, as well as look, tracking my own life story, I've worked with others a lot in, in extensively with dancers and conscious dance and um, and creative writing and all sorts of um, beautiful offerings in that respect. And from that, I started to create a map that I could see that flowed through the lives of human beings um, and animals, if you like, and, and all of nature and to see what were the particular archetypal qualities and rites of passage and the, the significant moments throughout our life that helped us to identify what the soul's journey and what the soul purpose was. So I honor the sacred contract that we've all come to work with. I firmly believe that we each come here with a particular mission, something that we are here to bring and we feel it when we're awake enough and we're um, conscious enough. We do feel it, we know there's something we're here for. And if we can acknowledge that um, and then start a journey to explore it, it won't happen overnight. Um, we will have to track a lot of our life story. We'll have to change our perspectives on things. We'll have to start seeing them, not from a, the eyes of a victim, but through the eyes of somebody who's really awake and aware and can recognize the gift in all of our difficult and challenging situations. And then we can, you know, it usually takes up until our sort of older years where we can look back and go, oh, now I see, now I see why I'm here. And I think the stage of life, the menopausal stage of life, which I don't really like the word menopause. I think it's meno stop. We stop. We don't pause. We, we stop in that respect. Um, and then, yeah, and then we carry on with something new, something different. Um, it's not the end of life in that respect, but it's, it is a death of some old way. And then it's a rebirthing of why we're really here. And I love to explore that. So um, I have a map, I have a journey now that um, I work with, with people with, um, I call it from innocence to sovereignty or maid, maiden to matriarch. Um, I have two bodies work. One is for men and women and one is, is just for women, particularly tracking um, our bleeding times throughout our lives. Um, and yeah, that's kind of, I, I work a lot also with polarity. So the, the polarity, you know, when we, when we come to work, when we're conceived, the, the thing that happens, which I, I just think is most beautiful, the, the very, very beginning of life, you know, then there was light. When the sperm connects with the, um, the egg, there is light. And this has actually been filmed now on camera by scientists. They can see this flash of light when the sperm meets the egg. And that is zinc. It's zinc being released from the egg. Um, creating that flash of light. But if we live in a world of polarity, which I believe we do, yeah, everything has its polarity, um, then there is the scientific knowing what's happening there, the zinc, the light. Um, but there's also on a spiritual level, is this the beginning of consciousness? Yeah, we can ask ourselves that and we can bring these two together. But what happens when that spark lights up you know, which is obviously very minuscule, um, the, the egg then splits into two and then four and then eight, as we know, and then 16, and it, and it grows and develops into a fetus. So our very first action in life is to split into two. <coughs> very first thing we ever mm -hmm. do is split into two. Masculine, feminine, dark and light, heaven and earth. There's so many polarities to explore. So we're already holding that. So the polarity I particularly work with is the core wound 
and the aspiration. We have a core wound. That's part of our mission is to come into the world to experience that. And then the aspiration, what are my solutions for this? How do I overcome some of this? How do I bring more light to this? And then how do I make it an offering for others? Yeah. How do I create this beautiful offering from my own wounds where the, the, the gold lies, the treasure lies? Yeah, the gift is in that. And the gift be, you know, becomes both of these things. Yeah. So as a little girl, I, you know, I had my difficulties, I had my struggles growing up. Um, and you know, my solution for that was to dance and to be in nature and to be with animals. And that's what I loved. So if I was, you know, if that was the way that I overcame my particular challenges growing up and I held on to that throughout my life, now that's exactly what I do. Yeah. When I love to write and I've written my books, I've written seven books and, I, and I've got another one on the way. That was part of that journey. Writing, dancing, being in nature, being with animals. Yeah. And, and so now that's what I offer to others who have had similar wounds to me. Mm. Those yeah. Are here to serve. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's just so powerful because that's this thing of trauma, you know, that, so that, that trauma and wounding being, again, a spiritual path and how, you know, to me, when I'm working with rites of passage, you know, if we, if we can make ceremony, like you said, bring meaning to it, then the trauma it becomes the gold for our our light to, for us to remember that light that we are, that spark that came in and then to give from that place and to receive from life from that place as well. And like that's to me when we're like completely switched on. And I think that, you know, so I just want to bring it back to the plant spirit medicine because that's one of the reasons why I made the podcast was because um, in my own healing practice, I'm having younger people coming to me who are in that trauma state where they can't feel their soul because we all are. So they've forgotten their gifts for, you know, and they're, they're, they're on their journey back to trying to feel themselves again. And so then they're they're trying to navigate the spiritual consumerism and then they're coming to plant spirit medicine because it's such a big thing now, isn't it? And what's happening is their trauma is being triggered um, and there's no holding uh, in the way that's needed. So they are getting stuck. They're getting stuck back into that trauma. They're coming to me for the work I call soul mending, which I know you understand. It's like the, the they're experiencing more soul loss or fragmentation because of the, the ceremonies they're choosing to heal themselves because I don't think that there's any enough understanding from the pe some people who are holding ceremony about trauma and I know that's birthed the trauma informed world now so then people are going to ceremonies because it says it's trauma informed so it's a bit of a minefield I think and so some are coming to me in post-traumatic stress disorder and verging on psychosis from plant spirit medicine journeys because their nervous system has been blown open, hasn't it? And so when we look at wounding and we look at trauma and we, you know, I feel when you're talking how grounded your work is in the reality of, you know, what we experience on the earth plane and being human and that we're all on that path of being traumatized and being separate and all of those things to find our way home back to our soul and it in a way it's much simpler than having to have a shamanic experience to blow us open to our soul it's a steady journey like you said of of uh, of going back and it's almost when you're talking about your work I'm almost getting the feeling it's like a life review isn't it yeah. Like when we pass over, we have a life review and I see the beauty in that. And so just to talk a little bit about wounding then and how mm -hmm. if you're imagining someone who's come to you, who's who you're working with to help them to find the gifts of, of their like what they feel is their extreme trauma. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll, I'll come back to what you're saying about plant medicines as well. I mean, for some of them, they're illegal now in our mm. country and we have to remind ourselves of that but then so have many drugs been over the years and I think if 
if a young person is going to reach out to something, these days it's trendy to reach out for the plant medicine. If they're not going to reach out for that, chances are they might reach out for alcohol or, um, you know, class A drugs or of, of any description. Um, and in a way, um, I think it, it doesn't matter what it is. The fact is they're reaching out for something because there is trauma there. You know, and they're seeing that as a possible solution, but they're also being encouraged in an environment that says, oh, this is this is cool. This is great. You know, it's not so different from when we were youngsters. There was the possibility of alcohol. There was the possibility of drugs. If you have an addictive personality, you'll be reaching out for something, I think, during that time. But coming to that that arena of trauma, um, you know, why? Do we experience trauma? I think we're we've lost our kind of primal instincts as to how to deal with it. And if we think about what happens if we go through a traumatic experience, one of the first things we do is hold our breath. Yeah, one of the very first things that most people do if you there's a sudden shock of something or you don't want to feel something, it's like hold my breath. Yeah, um, and we don't reclaim that breath. Now, breath actually means the Latin word in spiritus, spiritus, breath. You know, breath means spirit. Yeah, it's the Latin word for spirit. <clears throat> and um, you know, spirit is the Latin word for breath. So if we do our work on that, if we're looking at, you know, what what is it that I've let go of when I've experienced this, the trauma, the challenges, what I've actually let go of is spirit in that moment and the trust in a, something greater than myself. Yeah. And so it becomes very ego centered. I've got to control and protect myself. I don't breathe much. Um, I'm holding everything in. I'm preventing anybody from seeing how I feel. And I'm kind of rigid, stuck in this within this field of experience. And so that that means the trauma stays there. Now, our primal nature, like an animal, would, would release, shake, run, take deep breaths in order to reclaim a sense of spirit. A spirit meaning breath, yeah, um, means that that is the biggest entity in this world. We can think of spirit as being um, some god figure or angelic beings or, you know, something up in the clouds, something far away. But actually, if, if spirit actually means breath, then it's this that's all around us, air, oxygen, this incredibly amazing element that holds us and keeps us alive. Can we trust in that elemental force that is ours, that feeds our soul, that nourishes us, that um, helps us to connect with each other because we're all breathing the same air? It's the one. It's the one thing that we all have deeply in common, you know, is the air that we breathe. And if that is spirit, then it is the lack of spirit that's happening to us when we forget to breathe or we stop breathing because of some bad experience. That if we can learn to start breathing again and saying, leaning in to this mighty force that's nourishing and holding us, and supporting us, keeping us alive throughout our life, and trust in that. We start to breathe more deeply, and then we start to feel all those locked-in feelings that were there from the very beginning. We start to feel them from that first moment of trauma. We start to experience the pain around that and the difficulties around that. And if we're held in a, a caring, um, understanding circle of people that we can trust, that don't try to fix us, that don't try to say they're there, it's all right, you know, wipe your tears or anything like that. They just let us feel and breathe and release. Then we can move beyond some of that trauma. Depending how deep it is, we may have to go into these places over and over, but we also then start to see the gift within it. I had abuse in my life. I work a lot with women who've been abused. I know what, what that feels like. I know what it's like to shut that story down um, and how it's affected us in our, you know, the, the relationships that we can have later on. Um, so there is a gift in that for me. There are no regrets about what has happened to me. 
I breathed through so much of that. Um, it was a great catalyst for my feminine power. What really wanted to shine through, that really wanted to be the wild feminine, that didn't want to be controlled, yeah, that had so many expectations put on her that um, you know, she had to fight against them most of her life. I am who I am. And I have had great catalysts for helping me with my growth, which, you know, most people say, well, that's terrible what that person did. Well, you know, yes, it is. It's a terrible act, but it's made me who I am today. And I'm grateful for it. Absolutely. So that so I'm just feeling one question to ask you. What do you think about teachers? What's this, you know, this part of this new evolution that we're in, this evolutionary time that we're in of like coming into the new earth and all of those things. Is this, you know, guru student question that's going on? And, you know, it's interesting, isn't it? Because we have our own soul. We have our own inner sat nav. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not always switched on because of trauma. And, you know, what do you feel about teachers? Do you feel like it's important to find a teacher or a guru? Or, you know, what do you feel about that and the journey of the soul? Yeah, I think teachers have always had their place in life. You know, we, we want to learn things. I've certainly had some really good teachers in my life, people that I've been able to learn from and grow with who've walked alongside me. But mostly the, the teachers that I've that I've most respected and, and most learned most from, and the kind of teacher I want to be myself is the one who shares their experience. Not, not somebody who reads a book or, you know, does a bit of a course and then says, right now I've got something to teach you, or here's something in a podcast. <laughs> you know, it's more like um, you know, somebody who's actually walked their own path re-evaluated their life story and can share from experience and their, their, the strengths that they hold within themselves and where they've come to in themselves. Um, mm. that's, that's the most important thing for me, I think. And yes, we do need those kind of teachers and, and leaders, yeah. um, those who, who can step in and can also step back and allow others to find their own process. Um, I, I think trying to do things on our own without support of others we our tendency then is to lean into our own thinking and our own way of doing things which has been distorted over the years you know most likely because we've learned to do things a certain way usually through protective um, mechanisms um, you know self-reliance um, trying to do things our way because we don't trust the adults in our lives um, yeah and, and so we carry on doing those things that way and that mm. doesn't necessarily work for us because, well, they haven't got us to as where we'd like to be in the first place. So that's what we have to ask ourselves. Has this worked before? You know, have I got what I've needed from this? Yeah. So, yeah, I think it's just re-looking at the word teacher or leader or space holder or whatever it is. And not just getting lots of information from them, but listening for their story and their experience. Yeah. And they share where where they arrived at in themselves from from what they're sharing. So um, yeah, so there's that you know because is there's just when you looking online and you see these um get a professional qualification in shamanism in a weekend. You know this is where I'm trying to get to these questions of like you know what what yeah you're looking at the you're looking at the person who's offering some teachings and you're seeing their own journey and their own story and how they've initiated themselves through their wounding into um embodiment I think you know when I listen to you talking I'm feeling how embodied you are through what you've experienced in your life and you've transformed it into that embodied wisdom that you are sharing right now and for me as well that's how I that's how I can choose someone I, I want to learn from. That is that and that knowing that they've embodied like it's not about qualifications or, you know, it's, it's yeah, you need some training, but also you need to see that the journey of the person and how they've become even more of who they truly are through what they've experienced. So, yeah, I honestly feel that it's only by looking at our life story that we'll know who we are you know mm -hmm. it's not 
it's not like you say a weekend course it's not okay. even a training in something it's what i call apprenticing to our life story yeah and that's yeah. what i created a map for is literally apprenticing to your life story rather than an institution that's so powerful i'm really touched by that it's so powerful what you've just said you know apprenticing to your own story is they i think that's where the new age is trying to get to in some of the distortions is that you know it's like we don't need a teacher we don't need a guru or anything i am my own guru and i, I even i say it, you know we're all holy we're all sacred we're mm -hmm. all you know, we have, and, and the Quero tradition that I do have training in is saying, you know, we all are the shaman in the end, but it's like <clears throat> apprenticing your own story, like really working through your own path and, uh, you know, not, you know, um, bypassing your own your own journey, you know, to get to, to, to get to somewhere that you think you need to get to just to, uh, and when I feel for young people, and there's a story that I tell young women, and it comes from Michael Mead about the half, you know, the half boy story. Have you heard that one? I don't think I know that one. No. Yeah, so it's just a really short story, but it's about how the young person, until that moment where they have to leave the village, mm. is only half, a half girl or a half boy because they've only got half their story. And the reason why they have to separate out and leave the village is because they need to find the other half of their story who are they without their family without their village without their experiences growing up and then that brings them into the wholeness of their you know the wholeness of who they truly are and then they leave home because they've found the other half of themselves their story without the story that they've been told or been in for all of their up until adolescence basically up until they leave home and I love that because yeah. then it feels like your work is going back and like um life reviewing all of that and allowing it's like um the initiation that happens through the apprenticing to yourself that I feel in your work is like that kind of life review is like um uh, in going back and catching up and initiating yourself through what should have been the rights of passage of being able to leave the village in a good way and have the holding of the elders so that you can find the other half of your story at a young age <laughs> so yes yeah absolutely and and that that's it's, it's a beautiful um yeah it's a beautiful way to describe it because we are only half our story aren't we at that age and i, I think for a lot of us we're only half our story when we get to our 30s and 40s even yeah you know? We've, we've really got to live our lives especially as we get older in years and um yeah we've got to live our life it's why I work mostly with 40 plus people because um they need to know what their story is they need to have a story to share so mm. that then start to create from that understand it digest it um see what it's about um and then maybe write the story you know encourage writing our own stories um, but you've got to have a story to tell. And then that becomes your legacy in the end, doesn't it? Because you can uh, leave it behind just by being yourself for the next generations. And uh, One of my elders, one of my teachers has just uh, passed over. She's 94. She's actually the, on the podcast before the last one I did. And I just managed to get her in and then she passed, she's passed over. And it was really interesting um, that, because we were around her um, when she was passing that, you know, she's this incredible woman who like 50 years ago built a temple in Dorset and started training women, you know, with uh, in shamanic traditions that she'd been taught. And, you know, and her coming to the end of, of that, of this incarnation and the story that she had, had that had unfolded for her and how she brought it into that wisdom that she could then share and then to have to leave it and to take that last breath that you're talking about to let that last breath finally go and if you carry that old trauma story it must be you know because I do work with people passing over how difficult it is to let that last breath grow go because this so much unresolved uh like i said you know all that unresolved stuff that you haven't really been able to live fully your legacy your 
story and then you get to the point of death and you're like you haven't even really begun to live your life and now you've got to leave and so yeah it's powerful isn't it that it's even for your death that you need to find your you know do the work that you're saying absolutely absolutely it's going to be present in that moment isn't it (laughs) if you can be of course we don't always have that luxury or the ability or even yeah. but it, yeah it, you can it's it's about being conscious and and there there is the unconscious that goes on but sometimes we're just too conscious as well we're too and that <laughs> leads to more sort of being in control and it has to be this way and it has to be that way rather than <laughs> surrendering and just letting go letting spirit um letting god in whatever it is that we believe in but letting the breath be as it needs to be um, mm spirit be a spirit needs to be um and trust yeah. in some way yeah really trusting it yeah so we're, we're we're coming to the end um but i wanted to yeah my last question was like so what is the soul then if you could soul? describe to 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 our listeners the soul so and any the words that the soul is the 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 unseen part of us very particular qualities that we hold. And it will come through in our creativity quite a lot. And the particular qualities that we um yeah, that, that we express in the world. So um when our soul is freer within us, when it's not so hidden and diminished, in that light, the, you know, the light we talked about, the spark, when that's not um surrounded by protection and ego and and all the rest not that have anything wrong to say there's anything wrong with the ego we need a healthy ego we all need that um but when it's when it's shrouded in that sense um and very depleted in that way where there is soul loss um we we don't get to see the the beauty of quality within others or within ourselves um but when it is allowed to to shine through us then we get to see the beauty of people and the the essence of who they are. But it's not something that's, um, you know, we see people by the colour of their hair or their skin or the what they're wearing. And quite often, some of those things will reflect the soul. It will, there'll be a quality there that is reflected of the soul. Um, but we'll mostly see it through people's story and I always say, you know, when you when you know what your purpose is, that's when the, the soul shines the most. Because we come to earth with a mission and a purpose. I believe that, the soul purpose, the mission of our soul this lifetime. And when that starts to bring, when we start to bring that polarity together of the core wound and the aspiration, and we become one again as that soul, as that spark of light, then there is the most immense joy that we feel when we're sharing our mission. So that is, is palpable. We can see it. It's, it's so visible because somebody is incredibly happy when they're sharing what they love. So if you, sh- if you love what you're doing and what you're offering to others or the environment or whatever your work is, whatever your particular offering is, and I don't just mean your day job or, you know, I mean, what you're actually feel you're here to bring and you're fulfilled with that, there will be light, there will be joy, there will be that sovereign energy that you were born with. And that will be so clear. Yeah. And that's the soul shining through because that has been met. That is engaging. It's here doing what it's meant to be doing. We are here doing our soul's calling. Yeah. So that's what I believe the soul is. It's that life force that we hold, that we either bury away or we allow to shine. But we can only allow it to shine when we really know why we're here. Not who we are, but why we're here and what our mission is. That makes sense? Absolutely. And then I just feel like life can respond to you, you know? So there's like that giving and receiving with all of life. Like if you can allow yourself to get to that place of the expansiveness of your being then life can respond it's like it's also that thing of dimming it down isn't it yeah it can and sometimes the world isn't quite ready for what we have (laughs) we might have to surrender let go you know go on to our next lifetime before 
the book is read or before the work is really recognized, who knows? We're not in control of that. All we have to know is that we're here to bring our mission to the world and not in an egotistical way, but you know, it's where the, the ego becomes the hands of the soul. Our ego is here just to serve the soul, to help it into life, to come into life, to be birthed. Yeah. So what do you feel happens when the body finally expires? What's your feeling about the soul? Um, do you know, I, I, I try not to think too much about it. I do believe the soul has a sacred contract and it will keep, um, you know, um, being being reborn, coming through us until that sacred contract is complete. Um, what form that takes, I don't know. Maybe we are reincarnated. Maybe we're not. But I don't think, um, you know, I, 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 I don't know. And I like to say I don't know, you know, <laughs> and I don't suppose when I do go, um, when I pass, that I'll know particularly then. Anyway, that's my soul's journey. And if the soul returns to the um, the great source um, and and then is is reborn through another human being, another baby, then great. That's wonderful. But some of us will complete that that sacred contract this lifetime and some of us won't and we might have to keep the soul might have to keep going through different you know different birthings different lives in order to 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 grow and to develop that and maybe it will have a mission for a very very long time because you know, the world's you know needs to change with it but um it can't it, it can't control that i don't think but it can make a difference to some people's lives while we're here so yeah, my, my answer is I don't know. But if you've ever watched Soul on Disney, I think that's got a really great um a, a great storyline to it. It's a it's a wonderful what? film, an animated film called Soul. And it's on, okay. the, it's on the Disney Channel. And I don't have Disney Channel, I had to buy the DVD actually, because <laughs> it's just great and it's got such a lovely explanation of it. I watched it, I thought, oh, there's my work. That's what I've created. <laughs> story it's about these little yeah. on in, in the yeah. song so it's wonderful <laughs> oh great i'll look at that then oh you know i've got so many questions i could keep talking to you like for hours but you know we have to stop somewhere <laughs> oh, we do it again but, another time <laughs> yeah part two but yeah. um yeah just to mention your own uh podcast so for the for those of you you know um Caroline's work of Middle Earth Medicine. She also has a podcast as well, which I actually spoke on, but I just really love it because um, for those of you who are listening and want to understand more about what she's talking about with the soul, uh, speak a little bit about your podcast and what you're inviting out of people when you speak to them. Yeah, well, I started my podcast, um, gosh, it's nearly two years ago, and I started it by sharing um some of the archetypes that I work with and the oracle cards that I created with my mother-in-law and I started it with that and then I thought well I'd love to hear from other people about their journeys with the soul and so I call it soul purpose soul purpose with Caroline Carey um, and I interview people about their their journey with doing what they love to do and then seeing if there's any storyline that tracks back from the very beginning till present day. Um, and I, I have similar questions that I ask everybody, uh, but it, you know, each journey is so different. Um, I, I, I just wait to see what unfolds with it really. And uh, we, we've just had such beautiful people talking about their soul's journey on it and what they believe that is and what they do, you know, what do they do in the world? What's their gift to humanity? into the environment and there's been some great teachings around that and what I hope from it is that others might ask themselves some of these questions and and start to you know look at their own lives and think well how would I answer that question what would I say to that and um, and start to really think about their soul's journey um, you know and and what their gift is and, and and yeah just who they are and yeah why they are here yeah, so I was going to say any final words. If you if you were speaking to a group of younger people right now, what would you say? Any anything you want to say before we finish? 
Oh, do you know, I, I would say live your life to the best of your ability. Take opportunities. Um, you know, be kind. Be kind to yourself and be kind to others. And, you know, look look for the deeper meaning in some of your experiences. That's kind of what I'd say. Love animals. Love nature. Get outside as much as you can. And, uh, <laughs> and yeah, just watch. I think it's having a, a natural curiosity that is really important for all of us, but especially for youngsters. When we lose our curiosity, something in us um, disappears. So be curious about what you see, even if it's the clouds or the birds or the trees. You know, Be curious about the flowers. Be curious about your parents. Ask them lots of questions. And be curious about your elders. You know, stay awake to curiosity. That's that's what I believe. And I think it's really helpful. Beautiful. Thank you. So, yeah, thank you, everyone, for listening. And if so, people want to find you. What's your website? Um, MiddleEarthMedicine.com. Yeah, MiddleEarthMedicine.com. Two E's, end of earth and beginning of E. And um, I'm on Facebook and Instagram and lots of other places. So um, I'm I'm pretty out there. <laughs> you can find yeah. me. And you can find her dancing and singing and stuff you can join one of her beautiful offerings that she has to oh, absolutely. awaken to your soul yeah i have a membership platform on my website which is very reasonable it's only five pounds a month um people can join that we get to meet once a month in a little group online and uh, there's lots of other videos and information there as well so yeah amazing thank you so much thank you to everyone for listening what a joy um thank you, Caroline. Uh, really really grateful thank you so much thank you so much for having me it's been lovely bye bye bye